Luke Gospel series again today, but um, at our men's uh, Friday morning Bible study, uh, we were talking about our wives. That's kind of just all we do. We just talk about our wives. Now, we, we were talking about our wives in a way, and, and the conversation went, and I'm not too sure why it went this way, but we talked about uh, uh, something we hear as men. And sometimes it can be a harsh word, depending on the circumstance when we hear these, these words. But it was every man in the group, there's like six or seven of us, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, I heard this. And so what this word is that we sometimes hear from our wives is, I don't need you to fix it, just listen to me. So, you young men who are not married yet or getting ready to be married at some point in your life, keep that in the back of your mind. The sooner you learn that lesson... Yeah, the more important things are going, you're just going to be healing in your relationship if you understand that sometimes they just want to be listened to and not fixed. So. <laughs> so, so sometimes we hear a harsh word, and we've been talking about a harsh word today, and the, the, the message today is uh, uh, healing, uh, uh, our harsh word, our harsh truths before healing. And for some of you uh, more Bible scholar type people, I, I, I got to tell you, the, the, the title of this sermon series, or these two sermons in particular, are, are, are a little off the mark. I'll be, I, I am honest, be, want to be honest with you about that. This passage isn't really about healing, okay? It's really more about the harsh truths that Jesus brings forth to these guys. Um, but there is this element that is in, this, in the passage we looked at last week, we looked at verse 41, where it said, give your alms what's inside of you, and he told these men what was inside of them. If you remember, it was greed and wickedness, and basically I believe he was telling them to give that up as you would give an offering to God, give it and get forgiveness and healing, and, and I think that's where he was actually trying to get people to go, uh, but it wasn't the crux of what his message was for sure. But I do want to acknowledge the fact that there is a theme throughout Scripture from Old Testament to New Testament that sometimes God does bring a harsh word to us so that there is healing. That is true, Old Testament, New Testament. I love this verse in Psalms. Psalm 30, it says, For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Father, that's the, or, or, that's the Father that you and I have. We sang about being a child of God. That's who our Father is. He does want us to heal. But let me, if I may, kind of set the stage, because, again, the passage really isn't about healing as much as it is about the harsh word. And so today, let me, let me kind of get you where we need to go. The, the incident we've been talking about starts in chapter 11, verse 14. Um, right prior to that, Jesus had taught his disciples the Lord's Prayer on how to pray. Jesus, I told you, did this horrible thing. He healed a lamed man who was mute. What a horrible thing for Jesus to do. But if you remember, those Pharisees that were, and religious leaders saw what he did. They basically accused him of being the head of the demons since he had so much control of the demons. He must be the head of the demons. He must be Satan. And so then Jesus was a little, uh, I don't know if he was upset per se, but he sets them straight, gives them some divine wisdom, uh, and, and really essentially uh, challenges them on many levels. Let me just read, they're not up on the screen, but let me read just some of the key statements I believe that Jesus brings forth to these leaders. In verse 23, he says, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. He also told them in verse 28, but he said, blessed rather those who hear the word of God and keep it. In verse 35, it says, therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. And there, if you remember, he was referring to their, their hearts being darkened because their eyes were blind. He had done a miracle right in front of them, and they call him Satan. And they're not seeing it because their eyes are not working right. And so all that's in them is darkness, not light. And so the religious leaders, in their feeble attempt to essentially trap Jesus, they invite him to dinner right? That's where we, we, we were last week. And the, we began to hear Jesus give these religious leaders very harsh words. He, 
he caught their attention, if you remember, right in the beginning of the meal. He didn't wash his hands. And, and I just want you to picture this for a minute. This was a very serious ceremonial thing that the, the Jewish people did before a meal. And so if, if it was a Pharisee's house, they would have had servants, and they would have had a servant come around with a, with a pitcher and a, and a basin, and they would have, the, the Pharisees, all the men, would put their hands like this so that it didn't get on their wrists or their forearms, and they would pour water over them, okay? Uh, it, it, just picture Jesus in there. And all these guys doing this, and Jesus like, pass, no thanks. And just the, the, the looks that he must have gotten by these Pharisees, he didn't wash his hands. He, he, he astonished them, to say the least. And so he, he sets the stage there to make sure that they are kind of paying attention to what he's about to lay on them, which was some pretty harsh statements about their spiritual condition, if you will. He calls them woes, right? We talked about that a little bit last week as well. A woe is indeed a statement of judgment, but also it is a a statement or an acclamation of grief. And so again, I believe in in Jesus' heart that, you know what, he's more... He's more saddened that these men are are living this way and not seeing the truth than he is angry at them. Again, the heart of God, we know from the New Testament, the Apostle Peter tells us that God wants all to come to repentance, right? That's the heart of God. And and so I think these woes kind of work both ways, if you will. Uh, the, The rulers in their hearts, these guys, they weren't about loving God or people their hearts were really more about them. And to this point, during, during the meal, the Scripture tells us that Jesus starts, has been addressing the Pharisees, a, a particular group. The, the Pharisees, I told you, these were the enforcers of the rules. They were the ones that would bang on your door if you weren't given a tithe. They were the ones that were pointing out to you because you were sinning. Okay, They were the ones that said you had to do it this way. And we will see today he addresses a different group in this section. He's, he's, a gro- he's addressing the group they refer to as the lawyers, okay? He brings them maybe even a harsher word, if you will. And so if you have your books or have your Bibles, have your phones, however you want to do that, uh, open up to Luke 11. We're going to start in verse 45 and work through the end of the chapter. Verse 45, one of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. And he said, Woe to you, lawyers, also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed, so you are witnesses and you content or consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, also the wisdom of God says, I will send them prophets and apostles, some whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation for the blood of Abel, to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary, yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken the key of the knowledge, and you did not enter yourself, and you hinder those who were entering. And he went away from there. The scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard to provoke him to speak about things, lying and wait for him to catch him in something that he might say. Let me pray for a moment. Father God, again, we thank you for your incredible word, the testimony that you have given to us through the power of your Holy Spirit and given to us to hear and read and listen to today. Father, I pray that you would, you would open our hearts to see, to see exactly what it is that you want us to see to have our hearts open to hear what it is you want us to hear. Father, I pray that as we go through this passage today, that you would be exalted in all things. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Like last week, we'll examine the text and see essentially what, what were exactly the sins that Jesus was pointing out to these religious men and maybe see how they relate to our life. Are we doing the same thing, if you will? So again, the, this is a harsh word to our souls, but ultimately it is a healing word for our souls because of all the things we sang about, the blood of Jesus Christ has made us a child of God, right? So, who are the lawyers and the scribes and the experts of the law? Those three phrases are interchangeable when you see them in Scripture. They all refer to the same person or type of persons, I guess. The Pharisees, like I said, were the religious party that were enforcers of the, all the legal code. The lawyers and the scribes, the experts of the laws, were the one essentially who wrote it. Okay. Now, let me give you a, a brief history of, of, of Israel, so this helps set the context for you. Uh, Israel, Judah in particular, the southern kingdom, was captured by Babylon in 586 B.C. The temple was destroyed. Over 4,000 of their religious leaders and people were taken into captivity into Babylon. There was no temple, and so there was no ceremonial forgiveness of sin anymore, right? Because that's where the, the sin was forgiven, through the temple. And so they were in there for 70 years in captivity. But during that captivity time, what they did is they, they took their focus off the, the ceremonial law, okay, because there was none, and they began to, to focus on the written law. In fact, they started to write about the law and add to it if you will. It's also believed this is actually the time in Jewish history where synagogues actually came about that, that really didn't have, they weren't really there before apparently. But the religious leaders focused on the written law in order to help people connect with God because there was no ceremonial law. There was no temple to do what they had done before in terms of the forgiveness of their sins. And so with it came about questions, right? Well, how do, we, how do we live out this law that Moses wrote? And I'm going to pick on the, the Sabbath law because it's just kind of an easy one to pick on because they wrote so much about it. In fact, they wrote over 24 chapters uh, about Sabbath law and how to not break the Sabbath law. 24 long chapters in a book that I referred to last week called the Mishnah. Okay? So one of the laws that they had revolving around the Sabbath day was that you could not carry enough ink to write three letters. You could carry enough ink to write two letters, but not three letters. Now, how do you know how long your letter's going to be? I don't know. So, hence the problem with all this stuff that they're laying on these people, okay? And, and, and so, the laws became essentially less, uh, no less than about 6,000 different laws that smothered them, that burdened them, and essentially became so burdensome that it drew people away from God. So Jesus addresses these scribes, these, these lawyers with these woes. It, it, they focus, the woes really do focus on their uh, essentially abuse of the law or the Torah, uh, the, the Pentateuch, that's the same word for the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, okay? So just so you know. Uh, but the, the, his, his rebukes or his harsh words are really about how they abused God's Word. So we'll go through each of these like we did last week. Um, so we have essentially three more <laughs> specific harsh truths for us to learn from today. The first specific hard truth that I want us to learn from is that he told these guys, you're elitist hypocrites. Verse 46, elitist hypocrites, basically, is, is the way I've translated that. He said to them, woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. These elitist lawyers put, who put themselves above everyone else began to start to make all the rules for life. They, they laden the people with laws, essentially manufactured from the sacred text, but they were providing instruction. They were, I think in their hearts they were trying to help, to be honest with you, but that's not what they were doing. 
over time, it, it became a, a problem for sure. God, again, had punished his people severely for the past, for not following the laws. Hence, they are now in captivity because they have all the evil that they had done for now 70 years in Babylon. It's interesting, though, as you read through the Old Testament, you read about these stories and, and what took place during that time. Man, God was really patient with these folks. It took years and years and years of him putting up with their sinning before the judgment came upon them. And so we do have a patient and wonderful God in that respect. But the point here is that the religious leaders were working from a place of, of history, but they were also, I believe, working from a place of fear. And, and fear in the sense that they, they, they don't know what God is really looking for. And so they're, oh, well, we have to do it this way, this way, and this way. And so they, this certainly caused problems. And it goes back, to, they, were, they were afraid essentially to, get, to not get the law perfect. They, they, thought, they, they believed it had to be perfect, and they did because of the judgment they had experienced. And, but in doing so, they ended up becoming very prideful about the whole thing, and it became more about them than it did about God. And essentially, I, I believe it, it was in part, a big part, uh, the sin of pride that, that they end up falling under based on what Jesus says here. Again, the Sabbath is a, a, a clear indication of this. What, what did Jesus say about the Sabbath in the New Testament? He said, the Sabbath was made for men, not men for the Sabbath. It, it, the Sabbath wasn't meant to be a burden to these folks, but it became a burden. What, what can I do? What, what, what can't I do? Uh, you know, you, you pick up a thing of ink and you're thinking, okay, is this enough for three letters or four letters or two letters? Is this, is this good? And, 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 and now you've got to go, oh, I've I, I got to write this sin down so I, I, I can take care of it later. So I'm, I'm sinning because I'm writing or something. It's, it's just, again, it became just incredibly burdensome to, to try to live up to all that was given to them. And then, and then Jesus says this statement to them and says, you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. It, it, to me, I, it, it may be that the, the, the very scribes and lawyers that are writing these laws aren't even following them themselves. It may. I, it's hard to say exactly, but probably a, a better understanding or, or would understand this is they, these guys who are making up all these rules these people have to jump through the hoops with, they, didn't, they did not consider, they didn't think about the people that they were trying to lead to God and what it was doing to them. They had no clue. There was no personal relationship. There was no consideration for what these laws would do to these people on a day-in and day-out situation. And so, again, it became about them more so than God's love or God's law. So here's an action step for you today. Ask yourself the question, do I put myself on a spiritual pedestal and look down on others without seeing my own sinfulness and need for God's grace and mercy daily? Do we ever do this? And, and, and to be quite honest with you, I know many of you personally, and, none, and one thing I love about this church, it isn't that kind of church where there's folks that are pious and self-righteous. But sometimes that can, that can sneak in from time to time. We can get prideful about our own walk with Christ. And when we look at others who are trying to do the same thing, do we look at them and, and say, man, let me, let me try to help them walk through this. And that, the hard thing to do sometimes is to point out, hey, you're walking down a wrong path. Okay, But to do that lovingly and carefully and not just point the finger. Did you hear so-and-so, what she did the other day? I'm not hanging out with her anymore. There's a big difference on how we do this. So those, for those that are in spiritual leadership in the church, say you're a, a pastor or you're a teacher in some way or a leader, th this is of great importance. Because when, when, when you have the leadership, 
you have to be able to, to love as Jesus calls us to love. Do we make things harder for people to follow Jesus, right? Do we make it harder than it needs to be? I, 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 I remember the old saying, right? Don't smoke or drink or chew or go with girls that do, right? <laughs> Actually, not bad advice, to be honest with you. <laughs> but am I, I'm, am I hanging this over the head? And, and I know for, for my wife, I, she tells me stories of, of some of the churches she grew up in. And, man, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't play, use playing cards. You could play crazy eights on Sunday. You couldn't do that. That was, whoo, you were a bad Christian. You were sinning in some way or shape or form. Playing pool? Mm-mm. Don't do that. And, and, and so there's, there's times in our, in, our, in our culture, in our life, that we, we begin to put on Christian burdens that aren't God's intent. But to be quite honest, I feel like the pendulum has swung from that to be a Christian and anything goes. That's a bigger problem. So again, we, we want to look at ourselves. We want to ask ourselves the question in terms of what it is that I am and how I, am I helping, really, my brother and sister in Christ to walk with Christ. That's number one or number four, depending on your count. But the lawyers we see, they're, Jesus essentially calls them elitist hypocrites, the next harsh truth he brings to them is he says, you're truth haters. You're truth haters. Let me tell you how I get to there. So in verses 47 through 51, we'll look at it again real quick. He says, woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. You were our witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, also, the wisdom of God says, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, against you guys I'm having dinner with, okay? From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary, yes, I tell you, you, you it will be required of this generation. Folks, that's a harsh word. Jesus has just told these lawyers that, you know what? Every bad thing in terms of the way the Jews had held the prophets, every prophet that they ever killed, actually, it all lays on you as well. Again, a very harsh word, but to be quite honest, what is being said here is also a prophetic word that is coming forth. And so Jesus is accusing them in the way that they were trying to honor the prophets because they had these grave monuments to the prophets. And if you go, apparently I've never been there, but if you go to, go to Israel, there are still some of these uh, graves that are still around uh, in, on, on the outskirts of Jerusalem, I've been told. So, yes, they were trying to honor the prophets of old, but they don't remember and they don't acknowledge that their fathers, okay, their forefathers, were the men that killed them. They didn't listen to the Word of God. These men were speaking from the Word of God, and their fathers killed them. They, they put these monuments up, but they don't acknowledge the whole truth about the whole thing. They ignore the fact that their forefathers killed them. And so, in a, in a sense... You're denying the sins of your father because you deny the truth and don't acknowledge this truth. And he basically says you're going to do the same thing. Listen to that statement in verse 49. He says, therefore also the wisdom of God says, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute. God will send prophets and apostles and you will kill them just like you killed or your fathers killed the same thing, the same ones, the prophets. That's what they did, isn't it? We know the story now because the New Testament has played out. They killed the greatest prophet, Jesus, okay? They killed John the Baptist. They killed Stephen, the first martyr. They persecuted a whole bunch of people, so the, the, the Jewish people that embraced Christ had to scatter all around. And so... 
It came true exactly as Jesus said it would, and it all fell on them. And so, speaking as Jesus spoke, he says, yeah, not just the ones you did here and now, go back to your forefathers because you act in the same way that they did. And just a, just a reference to you, he talks about Zechariah here. This is not the prophet Zechariah, okay, just so you know. This is, this is Zechariah in Second Chronicles 24. In the Jewish Bible, they, they arrange it differently than a Christian Old Testament, quite differently, actually. But the last book in a Jewish Bible would be what we consider Second Chronicles. The story is recorded in chapter 24 of Zechariah literally being killed in the temple, stoned to death in the temple. And so that, just so you understand that reference there. But why does Jesus say all the blood of the prophets is on you guys? You asked the question, right? I thought somebody asked the question. <laughs> it's a good question. Because this generation had the privilege, the opportunity to truly meet the prophet in Christ. They're the ones that walked with Christ. They're the ones that experienced his miracles. They're the ones whose eyes were now blind because they couldn't see what Jesus was doing right in front of them. They rejected him. And in a sense, they re in, doing, in rejecting the prophet, okay, they are guilty of all the prophets. They're doing the same thing. So here's a, here's a lesson for us, I think, that, would, that helps us as we go through life. It says this, when someone hates the truth, they are bound to repeat sins of the past. Folks, when we hate the truth, when we deny the truth, we will then follow in the same path as others did when it comes to falling into sin. If we pick and choose what to remember historically, it can lead us down a very wrong path. For instance, let's talk about a sin that, that transcends pretty much any generation from the, <laughs> the beginning of the Bible to today, sexual immorality. We deny or hate the truth that sexual intimacy is designed by God to be reserved for a marriage between a man and a woman. People deny that. This was an issue certainly in Jesus' time with, with adultery and other things. In today's culture, hmm, to be wrong about this, well, it's a problem. Sexual sin is just one of many truths that we tend to ignore or repeat from generation to generation. But I, I want to remind also that God, God's greatest truth, I think, and we must never deny this, and I believe we must fully embrace it, and that he has given us his Holy Spirit, okay, to indwell us, and he has also given us his Holy Word to guide us. Those are two, two very important truths for us to embrace and to hold true to. So here's an action step for us. Let us not reject God being in us and with us. Embrace His Holy Spirit and His Holy Word. Okay? Embrace His Holy Spirit and His Holy Word. If their responsibility was great, how much more is ours who have the entire Word of God? In having this book we call the Bible, we, we have now a great responsibility from Old Testament to New Testament to, to listen to it, to learn it, to engage it. It is His words, and through the power of His Holy Spirit, we can understand the truths and be strengthened by them. You can read the Holy Scriptures without the Holy Spirit, you can, 
And you know what you're going to end up with? Falsehoods. Lies. But with the Holy Spirit, you know what you find? You find life and you find peace in the Scriptures. All through engaging with them. And so as the lawyers distorted the Word of God, God has given it to us and given His Spirit for us to interpret it and to live in it and to understand its truths. Amen to that? Indeed. So these lawyers, they're, they're elitist hypocrites, they're truth haters. One last one Jesus throws at them. Specific hearts, truth number six. He says, you're truth hiding stumbling blocks. Truth hiding stumbling blocks. Verse 52, he says, woe to you lawyers for you have taken uh, away the key of knowledge. You do not enter uh, yourselves and you hinder those who are entering. Uh, most people, when I, when I look at this word or this, this phrase here, keys to, to knowledge, what is he exactly talking about? And it seems overwhelmingly that, that most people believe that he, what he's talking about is that these lawyers were stressing the external and the ceremonial uh, religion, if you will, much more so over the, the heart that God has and the heart that he wants us to have and the repentance that he calls us to. And, and, and so there's this understanding of the key of the knowledge that revolves around this. They're, they're, they, were, they were missing the fact that God was calling us to, to live by ultimately by faith, that this is a heart-based relationship. And in the process of, of the years of, of adding to God's word that what these people were doing, they themselves miss the most important fact that God looks at the heart, right? It's in their Old Testament. When, they, when, when Samuel picked David, what did, what did they say? No, not this one, not this one, not because he's good looking and tall. No, we want David because God knew his heart. And so God still knows our hearts and wants our hearts. And this is, this is key to the, to the teaching of Jesus. Even in the, the very moment, they were leading people, the, the Pharisees and the lawyers, they were leading people away from, from God. Matthew's gospel echoes a very similar rebuke. Look at it. It should be on the screen. It says, woe, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. <laughs> you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Wow. They were causing people ultimately to miss salvation, to miss this relationship with God. It was right in front of them, and they closed the door to them and to themselves. I, I love what Paul, the apostle, writes in the book of Romans. Ultimately, I think about the key of the knowledge. He, he, he writes in, in Romans 10, 8 and 9, and many of you know this verse, okay? But what does it say? He's talking about what Moses, if you read back, he's talking about what Moses was saying and, and, and about righteousness. He says, the word is near you in your mouth and in your hearts, for it is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because you, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The key, <laughs> the key is this faith in Christ. And they missed it. In fact, they shut the door because they would not believe. They called him Satan instead. This this slippery slope, if you will, that Jesus is confronting the, the, the Pharisees and the lawyers about right now in the text actually goes back. It goes back earlier. And, and I, I, I want to bring this up to you. I know it seems a, a little out of place, but I, I, I want you to know that the, the loss of the key of the knowledge is um, it starts earlier in their walk, if you will. So in the book of Malachi, our last book of the Old Testament, says this, true instruction was in his mouth and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness uh, and he turned away from iniquity. 
okay? He may be speaking about Jesus there, but listen to who he's speaking about here. He says, for the lips of the priest should guard knowledge and people should seek instruction from his mouth, okay? For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. He's speaking about the priests, okay? And then he goes on, he says this, but you have turned aside from your ways. You have, have caused many to stumble in your instructions, and you have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Th- this slippery slope of, of bad teaching from the, the priests here starts back 400 years before Christ ever gets on the scene, and it gets played out all the way and doesn't change. From their Babylonian captivity, from that that time period when they got back out of Babylonian captivity, and now 400 years later, Jesus is is telling me, you you haven't changed. You're still doing the same thing. And so here's the lesson for us. Let us as Christians, okay, be diligent to know the truths of Scripture and to share them with love. Folks, studying God's Word is a lifelong pursuit. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you are, you, you are called, and hopefully, I, I know for most of us, we want to know and learn about God and His Word. And so it is a, a lifelong pursuit. And, and this is why we have things like, like connect groups in our church, so we can help people walk together and, and learn together. This is why we come together and learn at church every Sunday. This is, this is why we have our own personal Bible studies. I encourage you to have your own personal Bible study and reading time and prayer time. And so all of this should, should then drive us, as we have this relationship with Christ, to share that relationship with others. So the last two verses, we hear the guys that Jesus is talking to <laughs> basically, um, well, he, they're trying to trap him. And just so you know, if we start speaking the truth, um, people might get mad at us. They may not want to hear it, right? Right? And if we, if we actually confront people, and I'm not saying we confront strangers on the street and say, hey, you're sinning, you're going to hell. You're, I'm, I'm not saying that. But if we have opportunity to, to point out sin to someone, well, that, that confrontation, well, most people aren't going to like it. Even Christian people don't necessarily like that. But if you're a Christian, you understand, you know, with this, it's only when we see our sin we get healing, right? It's only when we see our sin. This is true for the Christian, but it's also true for the non-Christian. You can't come to Christ without understanding and knowing that you're a sinful person in need of a Savior. And so we, even as Christians, need God, don't we? We need Him immensely, which leads us to what I want to celebrate today, which is is the Lord's Supper together today. We need God, and one of the most beautiful things that the Lord's Supper does is helps us see and understand how much we have God. This ceremony is a, is a beautiful remembrance, first and foremost, I believe. It's also, I believe, a, 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 a spiritual time where we get close with God in our remembrance of Christ through his body, okay, through his blood that was shed for us, gives us an opportunity to, to reconnect with Christ on a, on a much, much deeper level. And so today, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, I encourage you, I would ask you to join us in celebrating the Lord's Supper here in just a moment. And as we take time, and, and we'll just, I'll open us up in a word of prayer, and then I'll lead us, and I'll close us, And today, I want you to come, uh, we'll pass, I'm sorry, we'll pass out the elements to you in here in just a minute. And so if I'd ask the ushers that I'd ask to come and and guests as us, just please come up and um, after I pray, we'll pass them out. And so um, as they get ready to to pass out the elements here, uh, let us take time today to examine our hearts, to say, hey, Hey, am I am I guilty in any way 
of any of these same sins? Am I a, an elitist? Am I a, being a hypocrite in some way? Am, am, am I uh, you know, causing other people to stumble in some way? This is our time to get close to God. To get close to God. Ask him for his forgiveness and to remember what that forgiveness cost our Savior. So let me pray. After I pray, we'll pass out the elements, uh, and then I'll lead us together. Father God, thank you for, again, this incredible time to celebrate what you celebrated with your apostles that night before you were arrested. You gathered those men together, and you took the the Passover meal and transformed it into something, something different, something even more meaningful. That your body, that piece of bread that you held up was, was indeed your body. And that it was going to be broken. And that your blood was going to be shed. It was going to cover as the Lamb's blood in the Old Testament covered the mercy seat, your blood is covering the mercy seat. So the eyes of the Father do not see our sins, but see your righteousness. So Lord, as we take a moment today to celebrate, to remember, Father, let us examine our hearts Examine what we do, that we may glorify you in Jesus' name. This event is specifically recorded in two areas of the Bible, um, in Matthew's Gospel, but also in Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. For the Corinthian church were struggling with sin. Um, they were struggling with sin that was revolved around the Lord's Supper. And so Jesus, or, or Paul, had given them some very important instruction to examine oneself, hopefully as we did just in moments ago. But then Paul does lead them in the, leading the supper together. And he's for, basically said, for I received from the Lord 
what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. same way he took the cup, saying, this is the new covenant of my blood. Drink it, all of you, in remembrance of me. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for this time of remembrance, this time to celebrate your love for us, perfectly displayed on the cross. They call it the passion. And it is with great passion and love that you endured this cross. You endured it because of your great love for us. Your desire to be back in fellowship with, with your people, those that you have made in the image of God. So, Lord, as we have taken time to remember your broken body and your spilt blood, let us walk from this place today renewed in our faith and strengthened in our faith and confirmed of your presence in more and more powerful ways. Let your spirit lead us and guide us to be your witnesses, to be strengthened in our weakness, and to bring hope to the masses. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody says, Amen.